Hi, I'm Leslie Higgins. And I'm Greg Gillis. And we are corporate coaches, and we are coaches here at Google. And we're going to give you a uh, presentation and some practice with some tools on impactful communication. I'd like to start with some introductions. First, we're here as part of Coaches Week at Google. And I don't know, it might be good to just give you an overview of, so what is coaching? And there's lots of definitions of coaching, and there's even lots of kinds of coaching. The kind of coaching that Greg and I do and the coaching that's done at Google is really um, what we'll call corporate or business or executive coaching. So it tends to be usually around your leadership and interpersonal effectiveness. And the way I describe coaching is it's a leadership development program that is custom tailored to your individual strengths and, um, and business objectives. And it's something that happens over time because a lot of us, we might go to the best class in the world, including classes that are here at Google. We learn some really great tools. We come away with great intentions. And then we go back to our job. And life happens. And we revert back to our habits. So coaching engagements tend to happen over a three to six month period so that you've got lots of time to learn and implement new behaviors. And a lot of uh, the clients that Leslie and I work with are successful people. I think the majority of our clients are very successful in their jobs. What you find is as you move on in your job and as you get promoted and as you get more responsibility, the things that worked really, really well for you in the beginning may not work so well anymore. And a lot of times you're wondering, how do I change now? We're all superstitious. We're, we were successful doing these things to get here. Now how do we shift to do different things? We kind of want to hold on to the things that got us to the point we're at. So coaching a lot of times is moving to the next level and knowing what to let go of, what doesn't necessarily work well anymore. One of the times that I was coached, and I was coached three times before I made a career change, was at a point where I had moved to um, the vice president level. I was actually working at Charles Schwab and running one of the technology organizations. And I'd gotten promoted because I was a really good project person, really, really effective at mobilizing resources and often doing things that had no one could even imagine we could do. And when I became a vice president, it was sort of like everything that had gotten me to that point was no longer the things that I needed to be doing. I was managing a more senior team. I needed to adjust my style from being less directive and more influential. I needed to think about how to build my relationships and my sphere of influence in a cross-functional nature. And my boss at the time told me, Leslie, you need to make this shift from being a really great supervisor to a really great leader. And it wasn't until I worked with a coach who could help me figure out how to do that? What does that mean? How do I change behavior? It wasn't until I worked with a coach that I was successful in making that change. So let's move on and talk about some of these things. First, we want to do a little bit more introduction on who we are. So um, Greg and I have known each other for a long time in our prior careers and in our um, current careers as coaches. And we each come from the business world originally. So I started my uh, career out as a software developer and moved up the ranks uh, into management and ultimately executive positions at Charles Schwab and was VP of Software Engineering at Commerce One before they went public. I've been coaching and I also do some organizational development or team building type work since 1999 and I've been coaching at Google for I think it's been about five years. I have a lot of different clients. Greg and I have a lot of clients in common but the majority of my clients are technology organizations or organizations that are very, very dependent on technology to run their business. And my career started in sales. I was technology sales. Um, various companies, Xerox to begin with, Silicon Graphics, Netscape, and then Commerce One where I met Leslie. We were both in the company about the same time. Um, my career in sales allowed me to be in hundreds of different companies, hundreds of different environments and different decision-making processes uh, it was interesting to learn how relationships were formed, how power was manifested in different companies. Just the ability to be working within so many different companies really helped me in my, in my coaching career. Um, I went to coaching in 2001. I've had a lot, of a lot of companies I've worked with, mainly all in the Bay Area. I'm a professionally certified coach through ICF, and I was on the board of the Professional Coaches and Mentors Association of Northern California for two years. What is impactful communication? We're, we're going to give you our definition. Does anyone have a definition coming in here? What that might be? 
that you want to share? We're going to give you a demonstration of what we think it is and isn't. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. I would ask the question, is it different from effective communication? The question is, is it different than effective communication? Might be very similar. And I think yeah. the reason we chose the word impact is to really think about something that is effective and perhaps is really helpful in allowing you to further your agenda and objectives. Yeah. Yeah. yeah thanks. So we're going to give you a, a role play demonstration of two different kind, two different scenarios. Okay. Leslie. Leslie. Yeah. Yeah. I need to talk to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what is it? Project Zebra is, uh, we're two weeks behind. Uh-huh, okay. Oh, no! I know, I was oh, upset too. Oh, uh, oh, I can't, I, I, great, I'm going to have to take care of this. Could, could we talk another time? Well, we're two weeks behind. I, I, yeah, I, I know, really, I know, but this is even more urgent. It's, not, it's good to see you. You, I'll, know, I'll, I, you, know, you know I'm there for you, but you know, I, got, I got something a little more urgent to take care of. I'll come back later. Okay. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to do another demo of the same situation a little bit differently, OK? Uh, Leslie? I, yeah. I, um, I need to talk to you. Uh-huh. Um, since you're my boss now, um, I need to let you know that we're two weeks behind on, on Project Zebra. Uh-huh. Um, oh, no. Oh, no. Leslie, I, I really need you to pay attention to this. This is really important. Okay. Thank you. Um, because we lost those two engineers last week, you know, they went to that other project, I just reanalyzed where we are. We're at least two weeks behind. And I'm going to need more resources. And since you're my boss, I, I thought you could help me, you know, pull in some more resources to this project. More resources. So you're yeah. pretty sure it's, it's two weeks? It could be 10 days, but it's, it's, we're out there right now. And you're, you're pretty sure that more resources is what's required to well, get us back that, on track? That's what I thought about, yeah. Uh -huh. Is there, are there any other options that you considered? You know, I mean, I don't know. I can make the case for resources, but I can't guarantee we'll get them. Anything else that we might be able to offer? We could cut some feature set. Uh -huh. there's, there's certain things that don't matter right now that if, I think if we cut those out, no one would notice. Mm -hmm. We can add them later. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you think being able to deliver the full set of features that we committed to and getting more resources to do that is the better way to go. Yes. Yes, I do. OK. So what do you need from me? Uh, I need at least two more engineers. Okay. If you can pull them from somewhere else, I, I need them on the project. Okay. All right. Can you um, follow up with some with I'll, an email I'll give that you just documents? Okay. okay. Thanks All right. a lot I'll, for your time. I'll really go, appreciate I'll it. Go. All right. Thanks, thanks for letting me know. All right. Thanks. Okay. Okay. That first one just upset me, <laughs> <laughs> even even acting it. Um, what were the differences there? Does anyone have any? feedback for us and what was different between the first one and the second one. Yeah. The second one, we actually engaged her in the conversation rather than two people occupying the same space. Yeah. Not really interacting. He mm -hmm. asked for her attention and wasn't just pushed out of the room. What did she do differently? She listened. What's that? Yes. Closed her laptop, <laughs> which is a big thing. <laughs> She's in the middle of a fire, a big fire. So that's an example. We're going to give you what our definitions are, and they, they sort of play back to the example that we just went through. So we, we say that impactful communication, it makes a difference. There's a lot of communication that goes on. Hi, how was your weekend? Weekend was fine. How was yours? It was fine. Bye. See ya. That's not really impactful. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Every communication does not need to be impactful. So we're not standing up here saying every communication needs to be impactful. What we're drawing a distinction on is when you do make, need to make an impact, there are certain things you need to be aware of. It affects the relationship. So an impactful communication will affect the relationship one way or the other. It might make it stronger. It might make it weaker. It connects you with the thoughts and feelings of other people. In other words, it, it, it employs some empathy. When she closed her laptop and looked at me, I felt connected to. Even though I was play acting in this role, she connected with me. 
for the first time, she was just blowing me off. We were not connecting. And the third one is there's a mutual understanding that allows problem solving, solving and creative thinking to occur. So without that mutual understanding, it's very hard to do creative thinking. She helped me brainstorm a different way of thinking about the solution, which is maybe I, we cut feature set versus just adding more engineers. So impactful communication, um, we also feel it's our experience as executives and coaches is that your ability to get things done is directly related to the impact of your communication and your ability to relate with people. Some coaching communications that Leslie and I run into often as, as executive coaches are some of the things we put up here. This is just a, a small subset of some of the things we, we talk to clients about. Um, we like to think about them as, as two different things. You, you've got skill layer things, which are, I need to be a better presenter. I want to have better writing skills. I want to manage my email better. These are a lot of things you can go to training classes for and learn about. There's also the, the second level, which is behavior-related things. And you can kind of think of these as you know, the server layer and the application delivery layer, or the OS layer and the application layer. When you get down to behavior, power, influence, presence, or showing up. Leslie showed up during a demonstration. The first time, she didn't show up. She was involved in an email discussion or war. Confidence, empathy, conflict, these all happen at a behavioral level. And as coaches, we work at, at both levels. When we work with someone who says, I'm having trouble with my uh, presentation skills, first question we're going to ask is, what have you tried? Well, I took presentation skills 101. I took videotape pre presentation skills 201. I read three books, and I joined uh, you know, a speaking class. If it's still a problem, we're probably looking at something in the behavioral area. Maybe it's confidence. Maybe it's just showing up a different way. So th that's how we differentiate these two different areas. And, and today, the experiential, we're going to do some experiential work on showing you diff different techniques, mainly down in the behavioral area, mainly in the operating system area. But as a coach, again, we may recommend that someone take a class in this area while we're working with them on behavior. There might be both things going on. Do some integration of yeah. both, both aspects. So we're going to introduce, uh, hopefully if we manage our time well, several tools that we've used in our work with clients and give you some opportunity to understand and work with the tool, actually something experiential. And our goal is to give you some things that you can go away and apply this afternoon in your work here. So, so the first exercise we're going to do is called centering. And. Um, what it is is what Leslie did when I asked her to pay attention to me, and she closed her laptop. And she took a breath. She did something, and then she showed up. She was actually listening to me. What, what did she do? You know, what is this centering? I like to just boil it down and say it's showing up. You actually show up for that communication. You're not doing a million other things or one other thing. You're actually showing up, and that's a decision you make to show up for that particular communication. That particular meeting or email may be really important. And how do you do that? How does that happen? Um, for example, here at Google, what if you're in a meeting where your manager tells you that your particular project's going to get cut? Maybe something you worked on in your 20% time. You put nine months into it. It's something you're passionate about, really important to you. And you go into a meeting and your boss says, we, we just can't support this. It doesn't have any bearing on, on product development. It's, it's not going to happen. Right after that meeting, you've got to meet a critical person who you're interviewing to join the team. Someone who's been recruited to Google, and you have to really interview this person and show up. You leave this one meeting where you're completely upset and aggravated, and you've got to walk maybe 30 seconds to the next conference room and have the next meeting. How do you shift into showing up for the next meeting? And that's what we're going to talk about. Um, does anybody here snowboard? Has anybody snowboarded before? A few okay. people besides you, I see. A few people besides <laughs> me. So the analogy I had of snowboarding was I decided I wanted to snowboard. Some friends said, we'll take you. And they took me. And we got to the resort. 
went to Northstar. I rented my stuff. They told me how to strap the board on. They got me on a chairlift. I got to the top and fell off. And they said, do this. Just watch us. And they went. And I was left there with all this stuff. And I had no idea what to do about this. So three or four hours later, I was done. <laughs> I was bruised. I was so sore. I thought, I'm never going to do this again. So I waited a full year. And it was the next season when I decided I would go to Sugar Bowl and take a lesson. And when I went to the lesson, you know, the instructor spent at least 40 minutes of the lesson, the first four hours, 40 minutes on how to put your snowboard on. The second part was 30 minutes on how we're going to get on the chairlift and get off the chairlift once we get there. And then when we, when we got to the top of the mountain, it was at least a half an hour on how to stand up. Okay, put the edge in the snow, slowly get up, keep the edge there. Once we learned that, we learned how to turn, which was my instructor, said point downhill. Now, if you want to turn left, swing your body this way. Swing your body that way. You know, we learned to swing our bodies all around. And it worked, you know? But it was a complete exaggeration of how you actually snowboard. And the exercise we're going to do is a complete exaggeration of how you would center yourself. Because your, your body learns through exaggeration and repetition. Like any other thing, you learn to ride a bike, you learn to play tennis. It's exaggerating things. When I was watching the X Games uh, last week on TV, they were doing the half pipe. None of those snowboarders were swinging their arms around like this, crouching down, sticking their butts out like I was trained. They looked very fluid, because it's all second nature now. So we're going to do a centering exercise that's about exaggeration and repetition. And it's about how do you get back to that center place after you've been knocked off center. I have some people that I think of when I think about this, like in, in sports world. Who can do this? In hockey, I think of Wayne Gretzky. He's one of the great ones that could do that. I'm a, I'm a Sharks fan, so I think of Patrick Marlowe and the Sharks. Always consistent. Doesn't matter if he gets knocked down, he gets back up. Uh, Tiger Woods in golf. Kobe Bryant in baseball. Tom Brady in football. Then you've got John Elway and, and Joe Montana beyond that. These are guys who. When they get knocked down, they don't think about, oh, I just got hit real hard. They center back to, to the middle and then go forward. World leaders, JFK, Martin Luther King. Anyone else have anyone you can think of that has this sort of ability to stay centered? Gandhi, exactly. Nelson Mandela. Now, these are people that do it so subtly you don't notice it happening. They don't go, whoa, hold on, wait a minute, I got to do my centering practice. It just happens, because they're so good at it. OK, so let, let's, I'm going to lead you through this exercise, experiential. And the first thing I, I need you to do, actually, is I need to trigger you. I need to get you thinking about something difficult. So I would like you to bring back a difficult situation that happened in the last few hours or days. It could be a really bad email you got, a really terrible meeting you were in, somebody you really can't stand being around, a bad interaction. I want you to bring that back into it and just think about that. Dwell on it for a few seconds. And I'll give you a little bit of time to bring something up, but I want you to really go back to that place that happened recently and sort of relive it. And while you're doing that, I want you to notice, is there tension anywhere in your body when you're remembering this? Is, it, is your heart rate changing? Is your breathing changing? Is your attitude changing now that you're picturing this event? And I want you to remember the attitude you have right now. OK, so what I'd ask you to do now is everyone stand up. And if you've got a laptop, you're going to have to set it down next year. I'm sorry. <laughs> you don't have to slam it closed like Leslie. <laughs> um, but you're going to need to have your hands free. So what, what I'd ask you to do is um, balance your weight equally on both feet. Again, this is an exaggeration of centering. Say balance on both feet. Feel the weight equally on, your, on the balls of your feet and the heels of your feet so you come to a full vertical position. And put your chin out a little bit so you feel very, very vertical. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take in three deep breaths. 
and I'm going to show you how to do this breath first. So I'm going to get four, you're going to get three. The first one I'm going to do is, I'm going to exaggerate that even. I'm going to breathe in my nose to my stomach, up to my chest. I'm going to breathe up into my shoulders, then I'm going to let it out with a loud exhale, okay? I'm going to do this. I, I'll just demonstrate it. Okay, let's all do that. Another one. One more. Now what I want you to do is feel the heat radiating off your face right now. You know, your skin temperature is about 90 to 91 degrees. We're all basically little heaters. You can feel that heat energy coming off of your face. And if you could, visualize the heat coming off the entire front of your body now. You just feel that heat radiating off of you. You know how you've been in a conference room that's too small and a bunch of people get in there and it gets really hot? Just feel that heat coming off your body. And now visualize it coming off the back of your body also. So it's balanced front and back. And now visualize it off the left and the right side also. So you're equally distributing that heat radiating off of you. And now you can visualize it off the top of your head and the bottoms of your feet. And while you're in this place, I also want you to think into how much space there is in your body. You know, from a quantum physics point of view, there's 99.999% space in every atom. Make up, makes up every molecule of every cell of your body. So you're mainly space. So go into that space. Feel the spaciousness inside yourself. OK, everyone can sit back down. So now what I'd like you to do is bring back the incident, the person, the email, the meeting. Bring that back into consciousness, the thing you were thinking about before. Is there any difference? What do you notice now? Not as tense as the first time. Anyone else? Heartbeat different? Are you in a different attitude than the first time you were thinking about that person? You are. So this is what we did was we changed our state. Our state is the way we are. And if you come out of that hot incident, and, and in this case we recreated it artificially, you come out of this hot incident, how do you switch back into being ready for the next thing, especially if it's something important where you need to show up, versus carrying the trail of that incident into the next place? And what we've done is we've tricked our nervous system. And we have an autonomic nervous system. There's two sides to that, the sympathetic, the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is the fight or flight. We go to scary movies. We like to get scared. You're going to get in your car at night, and there's a shadow behind you. You jump. Someone gets in your face. You don't know if you should run away or get a horrible email. These, this is fight or flight. What we did was trick our body into going to the parasympathetic, which is the opposite of that. It's uh, opening your pupils. It's allowing your stomach to digest. It's relaxing your muscles. What happens when you're in that place is you get a lot more information about what's happening around you, about the event you were thinking about. You're not as tense about it. The event's still there. It didn't change. Just how you're reacting to it. Leslie, would you accompany me in this? Leslie's done this once before because we tried this the other day. But um, if you take this bottle of water has about a quarter of the bottle in it, and this one's full. Just hold those. Which one's heavier? Oh, clearly. Obvious. The full one. And you're obviously going to know the answer to the next question, but I want you to grip them as tight as you can, hard as you can. Do you notice a difference? They feel the same. You guys can try this. Not now, <laughs> but later. You can go over here and grab a water bottle. But the point of this exercise is when you're constricted, you have a lot less information. You have a lot less information about what's happening. So the purpose of centering is that between meetings, you leave your 11 o'clock meeting, you're uptight, you're, you're agitated, you're upset. If you know you have to show up for the next meeting, 
That's why you practice this centering practice, so that in three to five seconds, you can shift. And that's what the people we talked about, the sports heroes, the world leaders, that's what they're good at doing. It's not that they don't get knocked off balance all the time with events happening to them. It's that they can shift back to center really quickly and show up for the next important thing. There's lots of things you don't need to show up for that you don't need to center, but there are some that you want to, you want to center and show up for. Do you want to go to your next slide? Any questions on this? So the water bottle exercise um, really helps me understand something that I work with clients on a lot, um, which is awareness of self and awareness of others. So if we're constricted, if we're anxious, I get like this, tensed up, our ability to sense the environment around us, the people around us, our own reaction is limited. Our ability, therefore, to choose an appropriate response to the situation is very limited. If we're able to have full command of our ability to take in information externally and internally, we can then make a better choice. How do I want to respond? Or maybe I need to give myself 30 minutes before I respond to this email that I'm very upset by. So you just have more choice, more awareness, more choice. So if you're going to use this exercise, you would want to practice it for a while, maybe several weeks. And it would take this kind of time. But much like snowboarding, like in the example I gave, it, once you get good at it, it, it's a shift that happens. You, you just start shifting it because it's a body intuition. Your body understands it. OK. Do you want to do slide advances for me here? Yeah. Thank you. OK. So the next tool that we're going to introduce and give you some practice with is a tool called balancing advocacy with inquiry. And this is a tool that has a couple of really powerful distinctions that I first want to introduce to you. So the first is to actually make a distinction between two basic modes of communication. Advocating, here's what needs to be done, here's what I need from you, versus inquiry, what do you need from me? And most of us, and certainly most of the clients I've worked with, are a lot more comfortable and better trained at advocating. Uh, so being aware that there are two primary modes. The second is, in the use of this tool, what we also do is go below one's position and state or inquire into the underlying context behind the position. So one way that I like to think about this is, um, anybody here also good at math? <laughs> or good at math when you were in school? Um, so I was really good at algebra, and I loved algebra, but I was always frustrated by the fact that you had to write out the way you got to the answer of the problem. You couldn't just state the answer. You had to show your work. So when advocating, we're showing the thinking process that we engaged in behind the position that we're holding. So when we're advocating, we're saying, here's what I think needs to happen. Here's how I got there. And we invite others to explore and challenge and build on our view. Here's what I think. Here's how I got there. What do you think about my perspective? Maybe there's a better way to, to solve this, this particular issue. Um, and with inquiry, we're doing the same of others. I might see, like in our role play earlier, Greg came in and he said, I think we need to add resources. And I asked him, are there any other options that you've considered to a frequent um, situation that I'm sure you've all dealt with too? Are there other options that you've considered? Walk me through your thinking. Um, an, a, a way that I, a time that I became really aware of this tool and used it a lot was in my prior career and when I was um, uh, leading engineering efforts at Commerce One. We, our religious war at the time was a platform war. And at, at the time, it was really around which platform are we going to uh, develop on. And we had two basic schools of thought. And the, ar the discussions were arguments. It's Microsoft. No, Microsoft sucks. It's Unix. No, Unix is too new. It's not ready. And that kind of dialogue, which is at that positional level, doesn't really solve anything. We just get more dug in, entrenched in our own positions. So what we would try to do is then have a conversation about, OK, what are the criteria that we think are important in making a platform decision? And are there some criteria that might be more important or have some different advantages for us? So what would be the process by which we would go through an analysis and assessment? And then we can have a dialogue that gets 
below positions and into underlying interests. And this is basically what mediators do. And anyone who's ever read Getting to Yes, which is one of the most famous and best books on being able to negotiate and work with conflict, that's basically what they're doing, getting below the positions to underlying interests or context. Please. So when we're leading through advocacy, these are some basic phrases that will put you right into advocacy. Here's what I think. Here's how I got there. What do you think? So I've given you just some sample phrases that would give you some examples of, um, of how to do that. What I noticed both when I was still an executive and when I became a coach was that I think we forget to give context often. We forget that there's a lot we know that maybe people working with us and for us aren't aware of. We have a lot of information that we neglect to offer because we forget we know or we don't think that it really matters. And we shortchange people's ability to make um, effective decisions or provide other solutions when we neglect to deliver that context. We deliver the context, people understand where we're coming from. It could, it could be the difference between buying in and not buying in. It could be that now that I understand what you're really trying to do, I'm in a better position to give you an even better solution than the one that, um, that you've offered. With inquiry, we're basically doing the reverse. So walk me through your thought process. What leads you to this particular position? Are there other options that you've considered? Um, how, will this, how will this scale over time? Is this a short-term solution? Maybe we need something that's more systemic in nature. Other ways of thinking about the power of this is how, how many people here like being told what to do? May depend, may depend. Um, how many people like being told flat out they're wrong? <laughs> I sure don't. And this is a way by inquiring into other people's perspective that we are understanding their perspective and we're also giving them the opportunity to consider their own thought process. Or if you've ever gone to someone um, with a problem and said, hey, can I just let you be a sanity board for me? I just let me tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm really stuck. And in the process of explaining the problem, you solved your own problem. So inquiry is effective in a whole lot of different ways. We give people support for their thinking process. We don't necessarily have to tell them what to do, but we ask them to think about it. We can ask some provocative questions that may allow them to see other solutions or ways of approaching a problem that they hadn't considered. A nuance of, of inquiry, um, some authors call empowering questions. And I love this quote, tell me and I'll forget. And, and when you get older, it's even harder. Um, Show me and I may remember and involve me and I'll understand, which is actually part of what we're trying to do today. Involve you, give you the experience of being able to work with some material and learn through that experience. So when we're asking empowering questions, they are an effective influencing and coaching tool, whether it's for people you're managing directly, people you're working with, people you're leading in a cross-functional team, or as a technical lead, you know, type of, in a technical lead type of, of role. So let me be clear, we're not giving people the answer, but we're supporting their thinking process. We're helping them to find maybe some different ways of thinking about this, the solution. That will, uh, that will move them forward. So here are some sample kinds of questions that you might use. So we're going to give you some opportunity to do a little bit of practice to understand. And actually, before we do that, we're going to role play. I'm at the center after this. <laughs> believe this. Cannot believe this. What? What's up? My boss wants us to do an early delivery of, of x-ray. So why are you frustrated about that? It's a throwaway. It's ridiculous. It's, just, it's a distraction. You know, in my relationships with your boss, she doesn't seem like someone who likes to do throwaway efforts. What's she really trying to accomplish with this? I guess she's just trying to get credibility for the project team. 
that's the only thing I can figure. Mm -hmm. Ear early delivery, get some yeah. traction. Yeah, uh -huh. show our capabilities. Uh -huh. um, it's just a waste of time. It is a waste of time. Well, are there any other ways that you might be able to meet that goal of early delivery? I just can't believe she said that. I mean, I, it really upsets me. Yeah, I see, I see you're frustrated. I don't like throwaway work either. But is, is there another way that you could accomplish the another goal? Another way? Well, we could, we could do the first part of Project Athena and get that done. That's not a throwaway. That would actually show real, real work. And it's, it's something that's you know, a real project. And you could achieve that in the same time frame? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it would show our credibility. It would more than show our credibility. How do you think your manager would respond to that idea? She'd probably say yes. I don't know why I didn't think of it. Hey, maybe you need to do some of that centering uh, process that I was hearing about. I was just so upset when she said that. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Okay. So what do you think you want to do about this? I want to go ask her. She'd probably say yes. I, I just didn't think of it. I, I, I don't know why. I was just so upset. But it sounds like this would meet her goal, and it's, and it's a solution that you'd really be in support of, an mm. advocate for. Yeah. Well, thanks for your help. OK, you're welcome. I wish all my meetings had been that easy. <laughs> now, that's a good illustration of the power of, of inquiry. And to demonstrate advocacy, what the manager could have done, what Greg's manager could have done, instead of saying, hey, I want you to do this delivery of whichever project, project. it was, um, she might have come to Greg and said, hey, Greg, I'm really thinking that it would be helpful for our project team if we could get some credibility by doing an early delivery. Here's my goal. What I'm thinking that this project might be a good way to do that, but what do you think? Maybe there's, maybe there's an, a different project that would be even better. And in that, so there's advocacy, which now tells Greg what I'm trying to accomplish and, and invites him in to brainstorm around a solution to the problem. See the distinction here? And it's my experience, especially as a former systems person, that we often don't give that kind of context. We don't talk about what it is we're trying to solve. We give a solution to the problem. And then people on the other side think, oh, that's what I have to do. And I'm not allowed to come up with a better solution. I may not even know what the real need is that I'm trying to meet. So to give you some opportunity to, to do some practice with this, I'm going to ask you to form um, groups of two or three people. And I've got some copies here of some of the sample language that, um, that we were just looking at. And I'm going to ask you to, do you want to pass those out? To, in your teams, just write down some statements in the first situation. Imagine you're going to your team. And instead of saying, here are OKRs for the quarter, how might you advocate that? Okay, how might you use advocacy? to uh, put forth your position. And in the last two uh, situations, envision someone coming to you and making these statements. And how might you use inquiry Oops. Oops. to better understand and help the person who's facing this particular, um, who's, who's espousing this particular perspective? OK? We'll just give you a few minutes to, um, to do some practice. Okay? You're welcome to do that individually or in, in groups of two or three, OK?
Okay. Anyone comfortable volunteering how you might advocate about your OKRs? Something besides so, here they are. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was quite difficult. It was, then it was quite difficult to actually, you know, go ahead and question his, his reasoning because he seemed to have like an airtight case for it. So he did a quite good job. It was just like a little bit of work. Okay. So the context of how I've come to yes. these particular objectives. Okay. And any inquiries that you want to volunteer for either of these two uh, positions that you had to receive. Yes. I don't know if everyone could hear, so the real emphasis was around in asking the probing questions, talking about positive things. So rather than why won't it work, well, what would work? What's your idea? Okay, very good. We have one more tool that we want to um, introduce, and so we're going to fast forward to feed forward. Feed forward. <laughs> um, this is another exper experiential exercise. It's different than feedback. We all know what feedback is performance reviews, what you did over the past 9 to 12 or sometimes 18 months. Feed forward is different. It's looking towards what you could do different in the future. So we're just going to do this. Each person, uh, it would be helpful if you pick one thing you want to change. And that could be something like, I, I've picked when I've done this exercise, I want to be a better listener. Another one I picked before was, I want to be at meetings on time. These are simple little things that are going to make my life better. And we're going to ask for suggestions from someone else on these things. And don't worry about who you pair up with, because we're going to have you pair up with multiple people. You're just going to be walking around asking people this question. I want to be a better listener. They're going to get. Oh, my. I think we need better chairs. <laughs> <laughs> Stronger chairs. Good recovery there. <laughs> Do you want to, should we uh, model quickly yeah, what we're so going to ask people to do? Only ideas for the future. Listen to the suggestion. And all you can say when the person gives you the, the feed forward is thank you. I want to be a, let's, let's demo this, okay. Leslie. I want to be a better listener. OK. Um, my suggestions for you to be a better listener would be, um, first of all, do that centering exercise before you go into meetings. and. Before, when you're in a dialogue with someone, before you offer your perspective, first use active listening and summarize what you've heard from the other person. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. All I can say is thank you. And all she can say is you're welcome. Okay? So as you go around, you use the same thing you want to improve with each person. Find a new partner. I want to be a better listener. They give you two pieces of feedback. They are trying to help you as much as possible. Your goal when you're getting the feed forward is you want to learn as much as possible. And I picked up the paper because I've done this before, and it's actually really good to write some of these things down because you're going to get some really useful stuff. So think of something that you want to improve. It doesn't have to be real personal. You have to share it with anyone. Just something that's going to help you a little bit in your life. It's going to make a, it's going to make a difference. And then we're going to give you um, a couple of opportunities to, so you'll find a partner, um, ask for two suggestions, switch places, and we'll give you two minutes, prepare, and um, you'll probably have opportunities to do two or three rounds of when the exercise. With, we'll call time. When you're done with the when person you're, you're talking with, uh, just find someone else who's free. So people will be freeing up, just wander around and interact with each other. Hi, you can say my name is, my name is, but after that it's thank you and you're welcome. Okay? Okay. Let's go. go.
Are we asking the same question to everyone? I'll talk to you. <laughs> Testing. Okay. Okay. Can we bring ourselves back to order? I know this is a hard one to stop. Sorry to interrupt you all. What would one word be to describe this exercise? If you had one word. Useful. Useful. Anyone else? Collaborative. What? Collaborative. Collaborative. Other words? Empowering. What? What was that? Positive. Positive. Empowering. Empowering. Are these words used to describe feedback? Usually not. When done well. Hmm? When done well. When done well. OK. The reason, you know, why is, this, why is this impactful? Why is this empowering? Why does this make a difference? We think it's because you're, you're allowed to listen. One of the main things is you're free to listen. You can't give any other response other than thank you. And in that, you don't need to be witty, smart, angry. All you have to do is say thank you. So you actually show up. Again, back to showing up to listen. You're free to listen. You can also focus on the goal, not the obstacle. 
in Focus on the Future. It's about changing something that hasn't happened yet. And it eliminates judgment. It's not personal. You're brainstorming together, working out a way that things can get better for, for, for you. And this is a really effective way of being able to do performance reviews. So focusing on the future, collaborating with people around what to focus on and how to develop the needed capability. So we're, at, we're about out of time. So. Another thing you can use this for is team building. Have your team together and say, how can I be a better team member in the future? and have each person one-on-one -on -one go around the room like this and just share with each other. Nothing from the past, just what can I do in the future to be a better team member. Really powerful. We're running out of time, so we're going to go to the end. So we, we challenge you to pick one of these techniques and use it in the next week. You know, use centering, use feed forward, use, balance advocacy and inquiry. Use these things. Just pick one and see if it helps you. See if it makes a difference for you. Some of the resources we use to put this talk together are here. Marshall Goldsmith uh, put together Feed Forward. Um, and these other uh, resources should help you. If you want to go find these books or, or resources, you're happy. You, we're happy to, to help you uh, locate them. This is available if you want to contact us. We can send you the presentation. And here's our contact information. And copies of our information up here. And we thank you for your participation and your presence. Thanks for showing up.